Okay. Uh, here we go. Right. To be two, part one. All right. So in case you didn't notice, today, finally, we're going to talk about sex. So. I know it's very poetic, and some people might not notice. Actually, first time I read this text, I had no clue what she was talking about. So some of you might have been in the <laughs> same situation as me. But this is really the topic, and I'm so happy that we're finally talking about this because this is a topic that is not really taught, right? You don't, there's no class teaching you right, how to make love to your beloved in the right way. Um, did you know that in the ancient world, there were classes like that, actually written, uh, there were actually treatises, whole treatises written, actually for men, right? So they would know how to make love to a woman. So there's, I mean, we know the most famous one is the Kama Sutra, right? Which um, you can find everywhere in Barnes and Nobles. Um, but there's a few others uh, in the Muslim tradition. There is the perfumed garden, very erotic, very insightful. Uh, you have, uh, of course, a lot of writings in the Jewish tradition, in the Talmud, about the first, right, the wedding night, how you should handle your, your wife. And then uh, you have, a, so in the Hindu tradition, the Muslim tradition, you have these texts, and I'm trying to think there's one more. And then there's a really great book uh, from the 20th century, which I would really suggest to everyone, is uh, by erotica writer Anais Nin, A-N-A-I-S-N-I-N, and she has a beautiful book called In Favor of the Sensitive Man. And in it, she has a beautiful section on making love to a woman and what, uh, what women need and support, what women want, right? Which is something that uh, men often ponder. But today, we're going to go into that too, right? So we're really going to go into the art of lovemaking, which we are rarely taught, right? Probably the last time you heard about it was in your sex education class when you were 13. And basically, if I will summarize it for you, if it hasn't changed from the time I took it, you were told, don't have sex. And if you do, all of these diseases will happen to you, including pregnancy. So please protect yourself. God forbid <laughs> that you engage in this a dangerous activity unprotected, right? So kind of a, a teaching based on fear, right? which is my issue with it. I mean, of course, we should learn to protect ourselves, whatever, but there's really an emphasis on fear. Be careful. It's dangerous. You need to protect yourself. What, all of this will happen to you if you, you know, take a, make one false move. So, but there's nothing taught about how to actually make love, right? It's all about how to not even get there, <laughs> right? And once you're there, don't know what to do. And the next best thing, right, is porn, right? And if you go there to learn, I'm, I really <laughs> discourage you to go there to learn. You will learn a lot about male desire, but nothing about female desire, right? Whatever you're watching there is um, very, very far away <laughs> from what a woman actually desires. Uh, or we have the Hollywood movies, right, where you have, you know, the steamy uh, sex scene in the elevator, which cannot happen. If, if you're a woman, you know this cannot happen. <laughs> this is not possible, right? The, it's, 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 you can't. We cannot mechanically do this. So anyways, so this is really, this is all we have, right? We have the, the, the websites, we have the movies, and then we have the fear-based fear sex education in, in eighth grade. Really nothing, right? So I'm really happy that we're doing a little bit more advanced class today. This is going to be interesting. And what we're going to learn throughout the class is that sex is really like uh, playing a musical instrument, right? I compare it to that. How many of you had to go through music classes, like had to learn a music instrument when you were younger? Put your hand. Okay. So how was it in the beginning when you picked up your instrument for the first time? How did your family members uh, uh, <laughs> react to your practicing? Was it beautiful, beautiful notes you were pulling right away? How was it? <laughs> Not that great, right? When you start with an instrument, you don't know your instrument. So you're trying, you know, and you're adjusting. I play violin, so, you know, for me it's very important. The sound is, is I create it, right, depending on how I place my bow. So it's, you know, it takes a while before you know your instrument, right? It's the same thing with sex, right? You can be talented, yes. You can be, you can have expertise, yes. But with every new person, you have a new instrument, and the first thing you have to do is learn your instrument, right? You can't be a good lover, like, uh, you can't be a generic good lover. <laughs> right? Might have worked with one woman, doesn't work with the other. Every woman is a different instrument, and the way to become a good lover is to really learn your instrument. And this obviously takes time, right? Time and in-depth, right, spent 
uh, time spent with that person, right? So, uh, so in many ways, sex is like an art, right? It is something that we develop, the skill that we develop over time, and in relationship to the instrument, to the beloved, we have to learn them. We have to learn what gives them pleasure. That is how you become a good lover, right? And we'll talk more about that, right? So, so it's, it's really something, it's a skill, it's not, I mean, it's true, some of us have more talent than others, it's true, but all of us can learn, right, the basic skills. Everybody can play a musical instrument in the end, right? So this is what we're going to learn today. It has to do a little bit with the, how to develop this skill. Okay, so we're going to look at three different stages of skillfulness, right? Um, Erika Wright goes over three different authors, right, who talk about sex, and she's going to Analyze what they say and criticize. And for, for each one, I notice, is a, le is a level, right? So there's level one, beginner sex. Then there's intermediate sex, I would say, and then advanced sex. So today we'll go into beginner, intermediate, advanced. And all of us are somewhere in that spectrum, hopefully moving towards advanced, right? So, and what I'm going to do today is connect what we do today with the boober. So we're going to see I it sexual relationship. <laughs> I, I sexual relationship and we'll be moving towards I you sexual relationship right now you know what this means right I it I I I you so there is really right the way you make love to someone can be an I it relationship okay nothing wrong with that you're beginning right but for irigurai you need to be become better so it turns into I I and eventually you want to reach mastery level which is uh, making love to someone in an I you connection right so we're going to look at that. Okay, first one, I it relationship, and she's starting with, she's going to criticize a philosopher who is contemporary to her. This is Jean-Paul Sartre, Sartre, S-A-R-T-R-E, very famous existentialist philosopher who's written a lot on love, a very kind of um, somewhat pessimistic, very realistic, almost too much down-to-earth approach to sex, and she's going to criticize him, right? So let's turn to him and see what he has to say, how she criticizes him, and then we'll see what is this first level of, of um, sexual encounter, right? Okay, so I'm going to read from page um, 18. Let me summarize first because it's kind of complex, and then we'll read the, the, the text. Basically, what Sartre is saying, everyone understands when I pronounce it French? Uh, I don't want to go Sartre. It's really going to hurt my, my, my lips. Okay, so Sartre. Are everybody good? Say after me. Sartre. Okay, very good. <laughs> so you're learning a little bit of French. Okay, so this Sartre he says this basically. All sex is power. We always try. Sex is about power. We want to get something out of the other or get something for ourselves. Ultimately, he says, all sexual relationships are about power. Um, and of course, Irigura is going to criticize that. She's going to say, yeah, to a certain degree, but it shouldn't stay on that level. Where Sartre says, is this? it's like that. Everyone deep down is about power. Um, so for example, um, this is kind of where you were at in high school, right? Have sex for status, right? I need a girlfriend. If I'm not having sex, everyone else is having sex. By the way, no one is having sex, but they're all saying they're having sex, right? You know how it is in high school, right? Maybe a few <laughs> are having, right? So there is a status thing. We have to have sex as everybody else is having sex. And now that I have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, okay, finally I can relax. I'm one of the cool people now. Status, power, right? Or that's usually um, both male and females do that, right? Or you will have sex so that you can show you're a man, right? Or as a woman, you will have sex so you can keep that man, right? Or you think you can. You can never keep the man. Man is very free. It's one of the wildest animals out there. You cannot, <laughs> I've learned this. Believe me, girls, you cannot do anything to manipulate that guy. <laughs> He's a free spirit, right? But often we will have sex to keep him. Power, right? So you can see how these early experiences you might have had, right? Or that we've all had to a certain degree. This is usually when, when we're you know, younger in high school sex as status or sex as desperation, <laughs> right? There is behind it the intention to have power over that person, right? So let's read now what he has to say. <clears throat> Page 18. How do I desire the other? Are you there? Who is there? Wave at me. Okay. How do I desire the other and enter into a carnal relationship with him? In being a nothingness, Jean-Paul Sartre maintains that the only possible way is to enchant him, right? Because sex is power, I have to seduce that person. I have to put some kind of pressure, 
right? Sex is about pressure, about enchanting, about possessing the other, right? I have sex with you, so I hope you can stay my, you know, stay with me and don't go everybody, you know, everywhere else. Or I have sex with you so I can affirm my manhood or my womanhood, right? This is all about enchanting, possessing, um, having some kind of power over the other person, right? And Yuriko is going to continue commenting on this second paragraph, thus I can possess the other, and according to Sartre, the fulfillment of desire does not exist without such a possession, right? So that's, and he's saying all sex is like that. And she's going to criticize. She's going to say, well, you know, maybe some of us do it like that, but we need to move beyond this, this uh, a paradigm. Yes? Have you seen Sartre? Have I seen him? Yeah, like his face. N oh, yes. <laughs> he's not very... <laughs> so that's, he's like a modern day, I mean, he was an incel, basically. I mean, he looks really scary. He does. <laughs> Wasn't his wife Simone de Beauvoir? Yeah, he had an amazing wife. I mean, you know, it's, I don't know how but he did it. They were polyamorous, yes. Uh, and but yes, she regrets it actually. Oh, in her really? in her work, uh, the second sex, she actually write, criticizes that. She says we were reckless, and I was going along with something that, as a woman, deep down, I didn't feel like was my thing. So it's a very interesting passage in Simone de Beauvoir. So yeah, there was definitely power on both sides, right? She was trying to affirm herself as a free spirit, wasn't working, and he was definitely. So yes, if you look at a picture of Sartre, it's not very, uh, <laughs> not very inspiring. <laughs> I guess he had to use power to, never mind. <laughs> There's no other way. If you don't seduce me, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it's not going to come naturally. Poor Sartre. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so that's the first thing, right? So we can see, um, right, and of course, okay, let's go to her criticism, of course. Last paragraph. But right? obviously she's going to say, right, this is insufficient. We need to move beyond that. Now, she's not judging, right? She's not saying, ah, you know, pervert. No, no. She's saying this is where we all begin. We start out like this, right? This is a natural uh, beginner sex. Most of us, right, we will start out with the desire to possess. I mean, we saw this in the Song of Songs, right? The woman starting out with a desire to possess, right? So this is very common, very natural, but she says we need to outgrow it, right? She says this in the last paragraph. The other is and remains transcendent to me through a body, through intentions and words foreign to me. So she says the other always remains a free spirit, right? You who are not and will never be me or mine. Right? We need to accept that. We need to embrace that. We need to celebrate that the other can never be mine. You are transcendent to me in the body and in words. And then she concludes, the will to possess you corresponds to a solitary and solipsistic dream which forgets that your consciousness and mind do not obey the same necessities. Right? The will to possess you is a dream. It's, it's a prison. That's what she means by solipsistic dream. It's a prison in which I'm trapping you and me, right? So we need to move beyond that. So here we can see clearly we are in the I-it category of sex, right? The other is just there to give me status, to give me companionship, to give me, to fill my solitude, to fulfill my sexual needs. Like, I'm not in it beyond, like, I need them for me, <laughs> right? They're there to fulfill a need, whether it's a need for you know, a love or a need for companionship or a need for status or a need to uh, show that I'm, you know, a man or show that I'm a woman, the other is reduced here to the level of the it, right? So this is sex in an I-it relationship. So, and, you know, we are very familiar with this, right? We are living in, in this times of, of what I call uh, fast food sex, right? You go on Tinder, you can just swipe, <laughs> right? And you can, you can basically purchase, not even purchase, it's free. Uh, <laughs> basically, right? It's so easy nowadays to hook up with someone. I, I can't believe how easy it is, right? You guys have it good. You know, don't need to do nothing. You know, just, just swipe, right? So, so we are, right, in a time where sex is very, is, is almost like fast food. You go, you, and you have it, you know, that very evening, you can have a possibility, right, of a hookup. Uh, and so we are really living in the culture where um, sex is so easily accessible and often is about fulfilling a need, right, beyond anything else, right? We are really living in these times. And Irika is saying, okay, you know, she's not a moral philosopher, so she's not judging. She's saying, well, this is, you know, this is how we all start, uh, but we need to go into more mature levels or more advanced levels, we need to reach uh, mastery rather than stay on this level, right? And by the way, um, just like fast food, right, if you are used to eating fast food, 
when the real food comes along, you'll be like, ah, oh, I don't want that. I want my burger, right? How many of you? <laughs> right? I mean, I remember when I, so, so I became a vegan a few years ago um, before I would eat everything. And when I was eating everything, I didn't, like, I would see a bean and be like, ew, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> it's, it's very healthy. I would see spinach and be like, hell no. You know, a kale, God forbid, right? When I stopped eating meat, all of a sudden my body shifted, right? And I started to crave things I never dreamed I would crave, like kale or black beans, right? And now I actually love them, right? Because my body switched. It's the same with your sexual, uh, how shall I put it, uh, tastes, uh, appetites. If you're used to eating fast food, the good food will come along and you'll basically not like it, right? So in a way, if you want to move to the next level, you have to go on a fast. <laughs> you have to stop the fast food for a bit if you want to transition. Don't think that by gobbling up hamburgers, you're gonna find true love. It's not gonna happen, <laughs> right? You have at one point to take a step back, right? If you're into the fast food sex, right? Irigra is saying, that's fine, it's nothing wrong with that. But if you wanna move to the next level, you have to stop for a while so your body can, the taste, the appetite of your body needs to shift. As long as you're eating burgers, you're not going to crave kale, right? A beautiful kale woman might come along or a beautiful broccoli man, right? <laughs> you're not even going to see them because you're into burgers. Do you see what I'm saying? Right? So everybody gets what I'm saying with my food analogy, right? So, so it is really important if you want to transition to take a fast, right? To go on a fast food fast, <laughs> no pun intended, and uh, really really kind of like um, give yourself the possibility of developing a different taste, right? Otherwise, you will miss the healthy relationships that are coming your way. You will miss because you're into burgers, right? So that's one thing, right, that needs to be in mind. So again, right, there's no do's and don'ts, no shoulds and should nots. She's just saying, if you want to move to the next level, this is what you will probably need to do <laughs> at some point. Okay, any questions on this first one? Uh, before we move to the next level, intermediate. <laughs> Good? Okay. By the way, this is today the day you can ask all your questions to the sex expert that is in front of you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I wish, right? This is your day where you can really ask any question, right? So if you, this is the last day of class too. So if you're really curious about anything, please ask because we can really deal with this and, you know, get a lot done like that. Okay. Intermediate level. This is another French philosopher called Merleau-Ponty. It's a big name, which you don't need to memorize for the test, um, but you do need to know it. Merleau-Ponty, if you see it, it's in the text on page 21, in the one, two, three, fourth paragraph. That's where this name is mentioned. Uh, page 21, one, two, three, fourth paragraph. But the subject-object dichotomy, are you there? That paragraph is what we're going to do. Okay, so Melaponti is talking about something, and then I will riff on it a little bit, but he's talking about basically the experience where you sleep with someone, but in the end you feel there was no connection. And you were just kind of just enjoying yourself, and they were enjoying themselves, but you don't feel like when you wake up the next morning, you're like, oh, who are you? <laughs> you're like, What's ha what happened? What did I drink? What did you put in my, right? You don't feel that any connection occurred, right, during the relationship. You were kind of both uh, end up in a very solitary position. And by the way, this can happen even in a marriage, right? You don't even have, right, this is not, nothing to do with, whether they love you or not, whether you love them or not, sometimes even a couple that loves each other will have sex and not connect, right? And Merleau-Ponty goes into the very dire <laughs> a prediction that all sex, right, misses the connection. It's meant to miss the connection because we get lost in our own sensations and inevitably we cannot connect. Uh, because that is the nature itself of the sexual encounter. According to Merleau-Ponty, the other will always escape us, <laughs> right? We will never feel satisfied. They will always escape us. That is in the very nature of the sexual encounter, according to Merleau-Ponty. Of course, Irigo is going to disagree. Before I go into her critique, right, um, I want to riff a little bit on that, this notion of uh, solitude, right, when it comes to sexuality, solitude. And why am I saying that? Um, well, I'll tell you. Uh, a few years ago, maybe a couple years ago, I read a, an article in the New Yorker about y'all's generation, <laughs> millennials, right? And what I was reading was really interesting. It was how millennials were having less sex than any generation before, right? So it was a much more 
people were much more keeping to themselves, right? Fulfilling their own sexual needs by themselves, right? There was a lot more solitude and compartmentalization. People were not really dating or even having sex, right? Even hookups were decreasing compared to my generation or the generation before. And so there is really a phenomena right now where we are kind of learning to kind of take care of our own needs, right? And trying to avoid getting in complicated relationships that end badly, right? After your first breakup when you were like 16, probably you were like, yo, this is dangerous. <laughs> let me, right, let me withdraw a bit, take care of myself, take care of my own needs and not, right, deal with the, the complexities and, and, you know, if difficulties, complications of a relationship. So there is a tendency, according to that article in the millennial generation, right, to really pull back and really just whatever sex is happening is by oneself, right? Is that we learn to pleasure ourselves and this is enough, right? This is enough to get the tension out of the system, right? So I want to talk a little bit about that, right? So on the one hand, it's good because you're exploring yourself, right? And you're not hurting anybody in the process. <laughs> this is great, right? On the other hand, it can quickly sink into what Buber calls an I-I relationship, right? You're now entirely self-sufficient, right? I'll give you an example of this. Um, this is a lecture that I followed. I went to a workshop once, and it was called I love female orgasm. And I was like, ooh, I'm going to learn a lot today. I'm going to go to this <laughs> workshop. Right? I was so excited. So I went and sat in a big amphitheater with a bunch of students. And that was back in the day when I was studying. And this couple comes up. And I'm like, yes, I'm going to learn some techniques. I'm going to learn finally. I'm going to figure this out. Right? And so they start talking. And for the next hour, it was basically everything in the house that a woman could use <laughs> right? oh to, to induce her pleasure. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is not helping, right? And then at, at the end of the lecture, a trembling hand came up, right? Someone said, well, maybe a man could also, you know? And he was so beaten up by the two presenters. They were like, yeah, 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 but we want to, you know, we want the woman to really be self-sufficient and, you know, really be able to discover her own pleasure. And I was sitting there like, no, no, <laughs> no, something is off. No, this is wrong, right? So on the one hand, yes, we need to explore ourselves as women, but to completely bypass the relationship with the man, right? We, and the, this couple who were teaching this workshop were saying, uh-uh, we don't need... We don't want him to come in the picture. We want her to be self-sufficient. And this is where I would beg to differ with Irigaray, right? Ultimately, what we are forgetting, I think, as a culture, is that our sexual energy is meant to be offered, right? It's not just tension that you have to release, right? That energy is ultimately meant to be offered to another human being for their healing, for their rejuvenation, for their energizing, right? And we are forgetting often that our bodies are meant to be a gift to another human being, right? We have become so focused on, I need to, you know, be self-sufficient and, you know, fulfill my own needs and be, you know, a, what's the word, independent. We have forgotten that ultimately we were made for another being. We were made for another human being, right? And we are forgetting, in many ways, the relational aspect of sex. Sex has become a hobby that we do, right, when we get home at night, <laughs> right? Has become a sport, has become a way to alleviate tension, right? And we have forgotten that ultimately sex is supposed to be a, an offering of yourself to the other. Your sexual energy is precious, right? And I want to talk especially to the males, right, because very often... Um, there is nothing taught in our society about the male sexual energy and how powerful and healing it can be when it is offered to another human being, right? There is something very powerful in that energy. And the problem is that it is so powerful sometimes that the man doesn't know what to do with it, right? And sadly, in our civilization, we are not taught, male, males are not taught how to cultivate that energy, right? And channel it. We are just, you know, there's nothing taught about that, right? Except if you go to church and they say, ah, don't do it. <laughs> You'll go to hell, right? That's all we're saying. There's nothing else about, okay, what do I do with it now, <laughs> right? I can't just repress it, right? So 
there's so much that I would invite you to explore in the Eastern traditions, right? In the Eastern traditions like Hinduism and, and Taoism, you have so much there about the cultivation of male sexual energy so that you keep it, so that you are in control of it, you are mastering it, and you're keeping it pure, right? So that you can then eventually offer it in your own time, right, to somebody else. Nothing in our civilization about this, right? And Irigaray talks at length in other uh, works about the importance of cultivating sexual energy because it is such a precious gift, right? This energy is holy. It's sacred. You don't want to just dilapidate it. You don't want to just waste it, right? You want to nurture it, cultivate it, so that you can offer it in the right time. And you have no idea, men, how powerfully healing that energy is on, a, on another human being if it is pure and, and well mastered, right? There's really powerful healing properties. Um, for the women, I would call it more emotional energy, right? That we need to purify. Uh, we women, it's more, we get obsessed, jealous, <laughs> controlling, possessive. We have a hard time controlling the energy of our heart, right? And the invitation is also for us to learn to master that aspect of ourselves so that when we offer it, it's not, you know, a clingy and desperate and, and jealous and possessive like the woman in the Song of Songs when we started out, right? We want to also learn to cultivate and master the energies of our heart, right? So the male needs to cultivate the energy of the sacral, right, of the, of the genitals, and the woman has to learn to control the energies of the heart, right, because those can be destructive. How many of you have seen this movie? Uh, it's a new series with a woman that worked, uh, that's, that played a, a role in Empire. Everybody knows Empire? Who's that amazing? Uh, you know Empire? No? <laughs> the, the, the girl, the woman that's playing in it. She's so cool. Uh, nobody knows her? Oh my God, I love her so much. Nobody knows her. No one can share this with me right now. I know who you're talking about. I'm really bad with Okay, okay. So she did another movie about like being uh, cheated on or something, and then the fury that unleashed <laughs> in that woman once she learned, right? We can be, as women, extremely cruel, right? We can, we can destroy a man forever with the words we say, right? The heart energy can be extremely destructive to the same degree that the male sexual energy can be destructive also if it is misused. So likewise, we need to learn to nurture and cultivate that energy so it can be life-giving and not be castrating, <laughs> right? So same thing, right? Everything here, right, which, which Irigara is emphasizing in this intermediate level, right? Let us not fall in the eye-eye. Let us remember that our energies, sexual energies, are meant to be offered, and let's not then just, you know, and either repress them or waste them, right? Learn to cultivate them, and I would really, um, orient the men in the room to these uh, techniques in, uh, in Hinduism, in, in Eastern thought. Uh, in India, um, the, the men are, are not allowed to have sex until they're 21, traditionally, right? The idea is that they need to learn to master that energy before they can offer it. So there's really a tradition of abstinence in India uh, b because of this idea, you can't go to a woman on <laughs> chaotic, right? You have to go to a woman masterful. Right? If you cannot master your own energy, when you sleep with her, it's not going to be as good as if you can be a master of yourself. Right? So I would really encourage all of us right, not to completely abstain from self-pleasure, but to begin a practice of mastery. That's what I would say. Right? This is not about, ah, this is bad, this is bad, and you're going to hell, whatever. This is about a powerful energy, which we need to start to slowly cultivate and gradually, without feeling guilty or shameful that it doesn't, you cannot master right away, but really work towards this goal of self-mastery because only when you have mastered yourself will you be able to offer that to a woman in a way that will be a healing for her, right? So that's the, the idea. So let's look at her critique of the I-I relationship. Uh, she says this here. It's a little complicated, but we're reading in the paragraph where I, I told you to go, but the subject-object dichotomy. So 21, 1, 2, 3, fourth paragraph. It also depends upon the manner in which sexuality itself is conceived. Maurice Merleau-Ponty considers sexuality as ambiguity and determinacy, which are related not only to the body, but to life in general. Okay, skip all that. Now going to what you underline. As a result, Sexuality does not favor the emergence of intersubjectivity, right? Here, this is the idea, right? Sexuality should favor the emergence 
of intersubjectivity. What is intersubjectivity? What does that big word mean? Anybody know? What's inter? Inside. No. Nope. <laughs> between. <laughs> That's intra. Winner, <laughs> inter is between. What's subjectivity? What is a subject? Any one of us, right? So you're a subject, you're a subject, I'm a subject. Between subjects, between people, right? That's what she means, right? Sex should favor the emergence of the betweenness between us. It should be relational and not just a thing we do on the side to let go of tension, right? Of course, there's a room for that too, but eventually we want to reach self-mastery so that we can offer it, right? Um, excellent. Okay, any questions on this one? We're going very deep today. We're avoiding no topics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It says that she does not favor the emergence of intersexuality. No, she thinks it should favor. Sexuality okay. should favor. Well, she says, uh, duplicity in subjectivity she's blaming Merleau-Ponty. She's saying he, his way of speaking does not favor, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's uh, criticizing him there. She's saying, oh, that's I your seat. Right. She's saying, your I, I approach does not favor uh, the emergence of intersubjectivity. Okay. Very good. Any other questions before we go to the uh, level of mastery? <laughs> which we've all been waiting for. Yes, go ahead. Um, let's say like you yourself are at this point where you're like, okay, I want to give myself to the person, but the other person's not that. The other person just wants to like eat you. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you do in that situation? So you can really, I've, I've learned this the hard way, right? We want to just, we want to offer pleasure. We, we're very tempted to just, you know, the, I've heard this argument like, well, if you don't have sex with me, then I'm stuck. I have to masturbate in my corner and you're doing this to me. Right? And really, there's really this, this kind of pressure. Like, if you don't have sex with me, I'm just going to go out and masturbate by myself. Right? And then you're like, well, no, no, I don't want this. Here, come, come. <laughs> right? So this is a genuine argument that I hear over and over again. I mean, the, the key here is to remember, that's their problem. <laughs> right? This is your issue with self-mastery. Right? If I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Right? So you, you can be very, but you can be nice about it. You can say, you know, it's not that I don't want to please you. It's that I want to. I need, a, I need a certain context to be able to open up. And I want to open up. I don't want it to be fake. I don't want to be inauthentic. And I need a certain um, a safe space to be able to do that. And so you say, for the sake of our love, I, I need us to take some time, right? And, but never feel pressured because this issue that he cannot control himself is not your problem. This is his problem. <laughs> but too often we make it our problem. Oh, hell no, I don't want you to do that, right? And so we, we go quickly so that they don't have to go. That's their burden. That's their challenge, right? So never make it your challenge, right? And always make it for the sake of the relationship. You never want to be like, well, screw you, you know. <laughs> you don't want to be like, you know, um, cold-hearted and, and not understanding, but you can say, look, for the sake of this being real and me opening up my heart, I need more time, I need this space, and so forth. So never be ashamed to really tell the man, this is what I need to be able to open up to you, and I want to open up to you, but if this is not there, I can't. We're going to talk about that in a bit, right? And, and then, you know, I think any man will be respectful of that if you ask in that way, not if you're like, uh-uh, you know, <laughs> with your queen's attitude, right? You don't, you, you don't have to, you know, demean the man or, or make them feel this small, right? You can be polite and you can be kind about it, but you can be truthful, vulnerable, right? Yes. Um, so, as I ask you, um, sometimes I feel like I have the opposite effect. Like, I'm like, I want to give you Yes. Where you can learn to cultivate that sense of honesty within yourself. Really. Absolutely. But I feel like sometimes in like in other countries, for example, it's like that's shunned upon. Like yes. no masturbation, no like yeah. zero anything. Like I feel like that's kind of counterintuitive. Exactly. Like people avoiding that. I agree with you. There's a beautiful movie on Netflix about a Polish sex educator. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it? What, what's it, it called? Oh, I have to look it up. I, I will put it on the on on the blackboard. It's an amazing movie about she's she was very pioneering, right? She even wrote a book where she showed little diagrams of all the different positions. I mean, it was really she was in the communist era, right? I mean, she was doing this. And she really emphasizes as a woman, especially to get to know yourself and to be able to induce your own pleasure, because otherwise, it's, 
why are you thinking the man is going to figure it out if you cannot? Yeah. <laughs> Already they have clueless. <laughs> and now if you're clueless, then it's going to really be terrible, right? So she's really encouraging women to, and, and you see in the movie, I really suggest all the women to watch the movie, you see how she teaches them to, to pleasure themselves. And so they get to know their pleasure and then they can guide the man. Right? or at least put themselves in a position where it will happen. Right? So absolutely, um, I think it's very important. Um, initially, masturbation as a self-exploration is very important. But if you, now you're going and doing that all day, <laughs> which is what many of us end up doing because it is an addiction. I mean, it's very hard, you know, especially if you're in a lot of tension and you're going through a lot and it, it's really helping. Right? So of course, right? No, I'm not, none of it is bad. It's just too much of a good thing <laughs> right? yeah. becomes a problem. Problem, right? So if you're seeing now that you're doing hours and hours in front of all kinds of porn video, this is when you want to rein yourself in, right? And be like, okay, let me remember what Irigaray said about cultivation and self-mastery. So, but absolutely, right? This is why it's the next step. Before you're making another make you into someone, now you're discovering yourself. So absolutely, masturbation has a process of self-discovery. Very important. You just don't want to go and do that all day uh, with all kinds of nasty stuff in your head, right? Okay, yes. <laughs> Yes, I think that's what irrigate. This is an Eastern practice, right? You cannot have sex too many times because you want to see it as not something ordinary. You want to see it as sacred, but also you don't want to deplete it. So there is a whole thing in Chinese medicine where if you have sex too much, you deplete your energy. And you, which is true to a certain degree, if you're really having sex three times a day, all day, every day, for day <laughs> honestly, it's not, you're not going to live long, right? So yes, so this is either to create more, more space and therefore to reignite the desire, or it is to not deplete my energy. So absolutely, moments, in fact, uh, there's a beautiful tradition in Judaism where, uh, maybe it's a little too long, but the idea is interesting. For, uh, did you know this, that in the Jewish tradition, even if you're married, for half the month, you don't have sex. During the woman's cycle, and then a little bit after, and then half the month, you can have all the sex you want. And I find this really interesting, right? Especially uh, during the woman's cycle. No one wants to have sex then. I don't know. So maybe some of us freaks can, you know, enjoy it. <laughs> but in general, right, it's very uncomfortable, right? So, so they, it's a way to respect the woman's cycle and also to uh, create the space in the couple, right, where there is this moment where the woman, you cannot touch her, right? Nothing better than, right? Nothing more attractive than a woman you're are not allowed to touch. <laughs> There's the desire spiking up. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is a really nice practice, I think, which I think we should adapt, right? But I think it's, it's worth trying, right? 14 days is a bit much for some couples, but at least the seven days during your cycle, it would be nice to experiment with. So yes, I think it would be a good thing, and Iri Gray, I think, is on that track. Um, good questions, guys. Good. All right. Ready for expertise? <laughs> Mastery. So here she's going to quote uh, Emmanuel Levinas. Um, this is on page uh, 24. And I hope you don't mind if I go over a little bit because your, your questions are too good. And, <laughs> and I want us to take time with this. You know, they say sex, you know, you should take time, right? You can't rush sex. So we're going to take our time, <laughs> right? Uh, good. So Levinas. So here he, so she's actually going to agree here with Levinas, right? She's she, for once, right? She's going to say, this guy is onto something, and I'm going to develop what he just said, right? So she's quoting a big passage by him where he's talking about sex, and the way he's talking about it, he's giving it a technical name. He's saying the, the, the kind of sex that is to be explored and cultivated, he calls the caress, right? You saw this word, certainly, the caress, like to caress, C-A-R-E-S-S. So he's describing this caress, or which is simply code word for good lovemaking, right? That's a technical concept which he uses when he means good lovemaking, right? And he's describing what it should be like, what it looks like, what it feels like. And Irigaray is going to be like, there, this guy is onto something, and I'm going to expound on that, right? So let's look a little bit at how Levinas defines this artful, good lovemaking way, which he calls the caress. So let's go to 24, third paragraph. So you're going to listen, and then you're going to tell me if there's a word in the American language which encompasses what he's talking about. So he says this, the caress consists in seizing upon nothing, 
in soliciting what ceaselessly escapes its form toward a future never future enough, in soliciting what slips away as though it were not yet, it, and I wish to add this is man's caress, it searches, it forages, it is not an intentionality of a disclosure, but of search, right? So this is a kind of, this is not about possessing, this is not about scoring, right? This is a different way to, this is a way of touching. Can anyone give me, in the American language, the word which encompasses this way of touching that you're seeing here described? You're searching, you're exploring, you're taking your time. Anybody know what's the common word we use for that? Foreplay, very good, right? Foreplay, he's talking about foreplay, right? And so, we, and so Irigara is going to zoom in on that and say, ooh, I like this. Here's, and she's going to expound on the crucial importance of foreplay. Now, this is important, especially for men, because for men, foreplay is not obvious. It's much more direct, right? The approach to sex for a man is much more direct. You, you get the business done, and you go home. Everybody eats a sandwich, eats, smoke a cigarette, and we're done. <laughs> so, right? So for the woman, it's a completely different world, right? So it's very useful for her now to describe this, right? The importance of foreplay for a woman is crucial, and we're going to see on two levels. Number one, on the level of ethics. Number two, on the level of pleasure. So men, listen up. This is crucial, imp important information. <laughs> I had students that came later to me after this class, and they said, oh, I tried it. And my girlfriend was like, wow. <laughs> so if you want to wow your girlfriend, listen up, right? OK. So first of all, ethics, right? Foreplay is, let's, let me define a little bit foreplay, right? Foreplay is really taking the time when you're with a woman to just get to know her body, right? You don't never want to go straight to the genitals, you want to do everything else first. There is so much, you have no idea. The woman is like a symphony orchestra. Every part of her body is erogenous. You're missing out when you just go to the main <laughs> thing, right? Which for you is the main thing. For us, you can touch any part and we're going to have ecstasy, right? The female body is extremely erogenous. Almost every part of it is erogenous and it is up to the man to really discover these different sections, these different parts. I call them the different, uh, locks. If you can unlock all of them, then you will really have an amazing experience, right? So this is really the time you take to kiss her, to touch her, to, to hold her, to caress her, to talk to her, <laughs> right? Don't be silent in lovemaking, please. It's excruciating. <laughs> we, we talk, right? Um, all of these things that often the man forgets, right? Because it's not in his nature, right? Man is much more direct when it comes to lovemaking, right? And so this is so important, right? And it depends on the woman. Some women, they get hot faster. 10 minutes is good. Other women, you need a whole hour. So it depends on your instrument. <laughs> you need to get to know your instrument. Some women will just pounce on you and it's over. Other women will be like, you know, they really need to be put in the mood. And it's not that you're a bad lover. It's that that's just the kind of woman they are. In the uh, Hindu tradition, there are three types of women, uh, hot, cold, and moist, right? So, the, so this is really three body types. Some women are cold body type. Some women are hot body type. Other women are more like voluptuous body type, right? Depending on the body type, you have to adapt your love making, right? If the woman is cold by nature, just a whole hour, guys, not less. The woman is hot, you're good, right? <laughs> you can, she'll get you first, right? If the woman is voluptuous, going to be in the in the Kama Sutra, they say that's the best woman, right? <laughs> so they they rate them. It's awful. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, so uh, so that's the idea, right? You really want to take the time to do this. Now, there's two main reasons you take this time, right? Number one, ethics. What, is, what you need to know as men when you come with a woman and you skip that is that no matter how much you love her, she's going to feel used. Any woman where you skip the foreplay, even if, you, if, if you're in a couple, you're in a relationship, you're married, whatever, if you skip that, inevitably she will emerge from the experience with a feeling of like, this was, something was missing, I don't feel, I feel a little used. She's not going to tell you, but it's going to be there, like kind of like a, in her, the pit of her stomach, right? Um, and, and so this is so important for the woman to feel like she's a you and not just an it, right? This is the way that you can create the atmosphere for her to feel like she's a you and not just an it, right? The difference between I it sex and I you sex is foreplay, <laughs> right? You want to be an I it lover, skip the foreplay, <laughs> right? Even if you love her, she won't feel it. That's her language, right? 
So as a man, the, 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 the challenge as a man is to translate your love into her love language, right? So, and your love is fast and her love language is slow. So this, the translation is difficult, but interesting at the same time, right? It's the challenge of translating the hot energy into slow, into a slow hand, right? So that's the first thing, very important on the ethics level, but also on the pleasure level, right? There, there is really, it's, it, it, it mechanically, as a woman, if you skip the foreplay, we find it harder for us to open up physically to you. And very often you'll encounter uh, challenges like painful sex, right? When you have sex with her, she feels pain, right? You cannot enter her because she's, she's hurting, right? Or, she's, or it's uncomfortable for her. All of this is not that you're incompatible. It's just, just need more foreplay. <laughs> I had a gynecologist, she, she suggested, give her wine. <laughs> it's like stupid advice, really. <laughs> it's like, really? So she can get me intoxicated? No. So, I mean, but the foreplay has that effect, right? If you have to intoxicate your woman and get her to relax, right? And you don't have to give her wine, but if you talk to her well enough and if you caress her well enough, she will relax, right? And at that moment, you can enter her without pain. So very often, you will have partners who feel pain, or you will be a partner who feels pain. Nothing, it doesn't mean you're incompatible. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you as a woman, right? It just means you're one of those women that need more time to open up. And so for the sake of the pleasure of the woman, it's so important to really take your time, right? Because there are regions really in a woman's body that cannot open unless you facilitate that opening, right, through the way that you touch her before. So, so this is first thing, right, that we're realizing, right, um, the importance ethically, pleasurably. But I want to go a little deeper now into the emotional aspect of sex. We haven't yet talked about it. We've talked about technique. We've talked about foreplay. Uh, we've talked about, right, the, the different levels. But we, I really want to end now on this aspect of the emotional aspect. Um, so we go here to page... 26, just one line, second paragraph. The caress is a gesture word. I want to stop on that for a little while. The caress is a gesture world, word, gesture word. Okay, what is, she's inventing a word here. What does this mean, gesture, word? First of all, what's a word for? What is language for? What do we speak for? What's the purpose of speaking? Yes. Communicate what? Exactly. Communicating something internal, we say a word so the person understands. Now, a gesture, what's a gesture? An action with your body, right? So this is, so what she's saying here, the caress is expression of something inside of you through touch. In other words, the caress, expression of feelings through your touch. This is a crucial element which we sometimes forget. Sex is the expression of love. Write this down, memorize it, <laughs> repeat it to yourself over and over again. Sex ultimately is the expression of love. It's not a game, it's not, you know, uh, a sport, it's not something you do to relax, it's not a hobby, it's the expression of love. It's a language. It's a language meant to express what is inside of you. If there is nothing inside of you, please do not express anything. <laughs> right? Why would you lie? We feel it, <laughs> right? And they feel it. Anyone having sex with nothing in their heart, they will feel it. Don't think they're stupid. They won't say anything, they'll enjoy the sex, but they will feel something is missing, right? It is so important to really take a, 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 a moment before you have sex and ask yourself, do I have anything to express? <laughs> Am I feeling this? Do I feel love for this person, right? This is so important in the sense that it, ultimately, right, this is what makes the sex good, is the fact that it is the expression of love. Do not go into it if you don't have any love to express because it will be hollow and it will be felt by the other and it will ultimately hurt the other. They will feel it and something in them will sink, <laughs> right? Um, and so we, we're learning here ultimately, right, that the caress or the best way, right, to really make love, whether it's to a woman or to a man, is to make love from the heart, right? Uh, and this is really what is going to open them up, right? So just to go back to the, the woman's, uh, what she needs to open up, and going back to Colado's question, right? 
what, what, what ultimately makes a woman blossom sexually, right, in a relationship is a safe space of your love, right? Just to go back to the male-female, right? Let me say that again. What ultimately makes a woman blossom sexually, if you want your, your woman or your partner to blossom sexually, right, you have to create a safe emotional space, right? The woman finds it very hard to do just hookups. We do it, we can, we're capable of it. <laughs> we're very good actresses. I don't know if you realize this, but we can fake anything. We will fake love for your parents. We will fake love for your dog. We will fake pleasure. We're amazing fakers, right? But you will sense something is missing and you won't know what it is because why? She hasn't fully opened up. The only way a woman fully opens up to you, the only way you can make that happen and receive in a way, her nectar is to create the emotional space of love. This is inevitable, and even I was saying to Wozniak, Simone de Beauvoir, who was the lover of Sartre, right? They, ha they were in polyamorous relationships. They tried everything. They were fucking their students. They were doing all kinds of things. You know, it, was, it was unbelievable what they were doing, right? Even she writes in her book, right, in her main book, The Second Sex, she says, we were reckless, and I was doing things which were not connecting to my femininity. I was not uh, embracing or honoring my femininity, which was to be in a loving relationship with this man, right? So even she writes, and it's very shocking, I was shocked to read that, because I thought she was, you know, complete free spirit, right? But for a woman, it's really, it's just the way we are made. We will fake anything you want us to fake, <laughs> but you will never get all of us in that way. If you want to get all of us, you have to take the step of emotional connection of love, right? This is why, by the way, it's impossible to test drive a woman, right? You know how people will say, okay, we should, we can, we should get married, but before, we should test if we're compatible sexually, right? So I'm not going to commit to you until we see that we're compatible. You know this argument? <laughs> Anybody heard this? We can't commit yet until we see if we're compatible sexually. You can't see until you've committed. This is the, the, the challenge, right? Let me say that again, you need to put that in your head, right? You cannot see if you're compatible until you have already committed. The woman will be only a stunted version of herself in a non-committed relationship. She will be there, she'll do whatever you want her to do, she'll get good at whatever you want her to do, but part of her will be absent and you'll never get the fullness of her, of her nectar of her love of her heart you will never get that because she cannot offer that she cannot fully blossom sexually unless she's in a committed love relationship no matter what she tells you women we know we'll be like it's okay babe we don't you know we can it's fine you know we'll be like trying to you know eh, pet you in the how, how do we say that with a you don't have this expression with a you have a cat and you pet in the in the direction of the hair do you have this what is this how you say it <laughs> Okay, okay. So this is right. We women, we will contort in all kinds of shapes to please you, <laughs> right? We will do it, and we'll be like, it's okay, I'm fine with it that you know we're in a polyamorous relationship, or I'm fine with it that you're cheating on me, or I'm fine with it that you can't commit yet. We'll say I'm fine with it, but we're not. <laughs> just, just know this. We're not, right? The woman can never fully blossom sexually and open up to you unless there is this space of love. And we women have to learn to ask for it. And this is what we are still incapable of doing. We are so willing to please you that we will sacrifice this basic desire and this basic need for the sake of pleasing the man. And in doing so, we will really uh, bring the relationship to its demise. We will tear our own houses down. <laughs> right? We, and so that, to go back to what Colado was saying, we have to learn to ask and say, listen, I would love to be in a sexual relationship with you, but I feel like I need there, there to be more commitment for me to be able to fully open up to you. Men, can you resist this? Is this the right way to say this? Help me. You really want to have sex really bad with a woman, and she tells you, look, I really need more time in order to open up. How do you receive that? I'm curious. Putting you on the spot now. Let's see. Let's see if the man can confirm what I'm saying. Or infirm. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I could be completely wrong. Tell me, man, where am I? Singh, Guzman, Wozniak, Tanvir, Klein. <laughs> Help us. What? Okay, so you're on that track. Okay, what about the rest of... Look at all them being waiting for marriage and we thinking we're surrounded by brutes. <laughs> <laughs> They're much more sophisticated than we think, apparently. Klein, Wozniak, 
interesting. <laughs> Everybody's hiding in their hoodie today. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. But the question was, if you really want to have sex with a woman, right, and she tells you, look, I need more time because I want to be fully open to you and I want there to be love and commitment, how do you react to that? Do you dump her and say, like, forget you? Or you can, I mean, is this, some, is this a turn off or, is, or would you agree to that? Okay, very good, right? Okay, uh, unless you're looking for a hookup, at that point, the guy will just disappear out of your life. He will ghost you, and it's a good riddance, right? <laughs> so if the guy is into you, like, you know, like Singh is saying, well, we, well, I guess we'll just have to wait. <laughs> he's, not, he's not happy about it, right? But he will be more understanding than we think, right? Very often we think there's only one way to please, right? We don't realize that we have, we must honor our desires. Why? For the sake of the relationship. If you want the relationship to be a relationship where you are giving your full self, you have to set those you have to ask for what you need, right? And many of us, we have not learned how to even say what we need because we want to be chill. We want to be relaxed. We, want to, we don't want to look uptight, right? But you can say very nicely. Be like, I just, you know, I need more time. I want, I need us to be more uh, in, um, I need the relationship to be more committed for me to fully open up. And, and so that's where I am. And I, I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to fake it with you. I want to be real. End of story. And then you see how the man reacts. If he stays around, he's, re he's for real. If he goes away, he was never there in the first place. <laughs> right? So really encouraging, right? And we talked about this, right? The art of waiting for the other in the Song of Songs, right? How we need to be patient with each other in that sense, right? Excellent. So, so this is what we're realizing, right? Very important. Um, the emotional component is really the prerequisite, at least for the woman, to be able to fully open up. To miss the emotional component, you will have the woman, she will have good techniques, she'll be nice to you, but something in her will never open up, and you as a man will feel something is missing, and you won't know what it is. What's missing? I will tell you. Her heart. <laughs> right? To, it, it will always feel empty and void, if the woman's heart was not allowed to open, right? And this is really in your hands, right? Okay, so to end, any questions so far before we, we end? Uh, any questions about this uh, or urgent issues you want to clarify? Uh, sorry? It all really it depends on how you feel, right? Do you, if you you have it, we have to as women to really tap into our deepest desires, right? So what is your deepest desire and what is your superficial desire? Superficial desire, huh? Why not? <laughs> you know, and you know it, it would be nice, and I don't want to hurt his feelings, and I don't want our friendship to end, and. What's your deepest desire? What do you really want in life? And at that moment, you have to really filter out anything that doesn't bring you there. You see what I mean? So you, as women, and as men, by the way, we have superficial desires. Oh, I want to hook up tonight, right now. <laughs> right? And we have deeper desires. And the key is to become in tune with the deeper desires and follow that, whatever they are. So Irigaray is never going to tell you, don't do this, do this, this is wrong. You know, you'll go to hell. She's going to say, tap into yourself. What do you really want? And follow that. And don't go left or right. <laughs> do not deviate, right? Uh, so that you will not be deviated from. So you have to ask yourself, what do I really want out of life? Is this what I want? Because <laughs> that's what you're going to get. <laughs> right? So whatever you want. And then you have to filter out anything that brings you away from that. Right? Anything that's deviating you. And so it's really up to you to answer that question. Good question, though. Anything? Question. Yes, Colado. Like, uh, how do you differ from, like, carnal desire? Because she actually, like, says something about that and, like, love. Because, like, sometimes, like, in the moment, you want to, like, oh, he loves me. But he doesn't actually love you. He loves your body. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I think we saw in the Song of Songs, time distinguishes, right, between lust and love. So initially, it's always lust, right? It's always chemistry, right? And it's really to the degree that they're able to wait for you and that you're able to wait for them is when love begins to take shape, right? 
So the test of love is, are they still there <clears throat> when I'm still sorting things out? And when they're still sorting things out, are you still there? So remember, we, we need time to become sexual. They need time to become committed, right? It is love really that gets you through that. And if you do not, if you're not able to wait, eh, that means it was just a, <laughs> a one-time thing, right? If, however, you're willing to wait, that tells me there's something deeper, right? How willing are you to wait for that person? That's the test. Does that make sense? Initially, of course, it's always chemistry, right? But then you have to come in tune to, am I ready? Do I want to go this far? Can you wait for me, <laughs> right? That's when love begins to form, right? Um, but initially, of course, yes, it's always, uh, <laughs> obviously. Excellent. Yes, Clyde. A lot of the stuff that's like I was waiting for that question. <laughs> That's, you know what? This is the problem with Iriguay. That's her focus, right? So I think I, it's, it's a lack on my part to not have a section on that, right? Because she's only dealing with heterosexual. Because for her, that's, these are, this is a problematic relationship. Now, I don't know about same-sex uh, relationships. To my perspective, they seem easier because the same sex, so you know what the other one wants, at least the basics, right? So it's easier to navigate. You, the only problems you have is, you know, different personality. Here in the heterosexual relationship, not only you have different personality, but you have different gender. And it's chaos. And that's why she feels she has to write about it. But So she doesn't write about the other stuff, not because she thinks it's secondary or not important, but because she has no expertise in it. You see what I'm saying? And neither do I, sadly. <laughs> so it's hard for me to teach about that because I don't know enough about it. So what I would suggest if you're in that situation is try to get what you can from this particular text, right? Um, but you're right, it is something that is missing from this class in terms of this teaching is, well, what about same-sex couples? What are their unique issues and how, what, how can we respond to those challenges? And it's, it's my lack because I don't know anything about it. I don't know if I can talk about it. Does that make sense? But does anybody want to apply what we talked about to same-sex relationships? Is there anything we can draw from it? Let's see if we can help <laughs> answer your question nevertheless. What can we get here from same-sex relationships? I mean, the whole class, in a way, you can apply, right, to same sex. Here, sexually, is more uh, honed in. Um, <clears throat> you want to try? Well, I noticed that when it comes to same sex relationships, um, it, there seems to be like that. You know, it's sort of thing going on, like there's a top and a bottom, and like, I feel like it's kind of. Um, like, there are people who switch, right? But right. And there's, like, people who are really, like, I'm only this, and this is only what I want. Like, they only either, like, they, they only want to be the one pleasuring instead of wanting to pleasure. Okay. And they don't feel comfortable. That's good. So Very good. That become, based on people that I've talked to about it, mm -hmm. then, it becomes an issue, right? Because the other person wants to obviously also please them. Yes. And the other person feels like, no, I have to be the one that's pleasing you. Excellent. And okay. So, but I think at the same time, because But eventually, it can kind of be like, you know, convince the other person to finally let that go down and just open up. Okay, I like that, right? So in a way, there is often power struggles where I will dominate and you will, I will be the active, you will be the passive, right? And what we're learning, at least what we learned in the Song of Songs, right, this can be helpful, is that the partners were switching. Right? The woman was sometimes active, the man was sometimes passive, and that was the beauty of the relationship. So, uh, and, may, and in a way also you can uh, use this uh, uh, here, this idea of being with an IU. Right? Remember, it's revealing the you to each other. So there is a, some kind of reciprocity. I treat you like a you, but I would like you also to treat me like a you and not just like an it. Right? So thank you. So, so I think this might be a way right, to, in the same-sex partnership, to go beyond the kind of sometimes rigid hierarchies or, or power dynamics and say, let's both treat each other as a you. And I, I don't just want to be your it, right? And you do this to me, right? <laughs> or you get this out of me. I want, I want to offer myself and receive. And you also offer and receive. So thank you. Very good. Does that help a little bit, uh, client? <laughs> okay. Yes. But this has often been the big issue. And I get it over and over again when I teach this class. Yes. 
I have to look at that. Let me put it on Blackboard too. Okay, I will research. I will give you the Polish uh, sex educator, and then I will ask around and see. Um, but that would be great to find something like that, so you can have uh, begin reflecting on it um, in the same way that we're doing here. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions? Um, this is your moment. This is it. This is when we will answer all questions <laughs> or try. <laughs> okay, good. All right, let me stop the recording.